Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. Savvy Painter, Gamblin Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on the Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintworks.com. First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250. But that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the call to entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. This week, my guest is Steve DeLuce. Like many artists, Steve discovered early on that he had drawing ability and he loved doing it. All through childhood and teenage years, he knew he wanted to be an artist. After high school, he studied art at the local community college. But this was during the Vietnam War and there was a draft going on. So instead of risking getting picked up by the draft when he wanted to take a break from school, Steve preemptively joined the Air Force as a medic. That way, he thought he would be fixing pain and suffering rather than being a part of inflicting it. After the war, because of the influx of GIs returning home and needing work, there was a job shortage. And by that time, Steve was married and had kids, so he re-enlisted with the Air Force and slowly worked his way up. But he still made it a point to keep his art going. I always found a way to engage my art. And I'm saying this so others who you know wonder if they have to dive right in full time or not. It isn't always necessarily the case. I found a way, even in a service, to engage it. I think had I not had that outlet, I probably would have gone crazy because it's really the essence of who I am. And I think most artists know this deep down. Eventually, Steve was offered a colonel position at the Pentagon, but instead of taking it, he retired from the military to focus exclusively on his art. So here I am, about 50 years old. I think I was 48 before I ever touched a paintbrush. And once that happened, it was really no looking back. I was smitten. In this episode, Steve and I talk about pivotal moments in his career, how he decided to focus on what mattered most to him as an artist and to ignore the chatter from the art world. And yes, I am using air quotes there when I say art world. We talk about showing up and doing the hard work that is required of us, why it matters when we declare our intentions and how stacking the deck in our favor when we choose to paint full time is critical to our success. Steve, welcome to the Savvy Painter podcast. I am so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for for coming and sharing your your stories with me. Well, thank you for having me. It's It's a pleasure to be here. Can you share some of the more pivotal moments in your career once you decided that you were going to focus on your art? What were some of the things that really affected the way that you were going to pursue your art or how you were going to go on to make your decisions? Well, you know, I think there were a couple things, actually. And the first is when I made this decision to explore the possibility of expressing light in a way that it appeared as though the light was coming from within the painting rather than from the surface of the painting. Mm -hmm. And so I began when I started recognizing the reflective properties of metal leaf, you know, like gold, composition gold, copper, silver. Initially, it was copper. I decided to try to exploit those properties in my paintings. Well, Over time, I developed this process using chemically induced patinas on that metal leaf, applying successive transparent glazes of oil over the metal so that when the light passed through those glazes, it would bounce back off of the underlying leaf 
and uh, create a stronger sense of light. At least that's what I was hoping. And sure enough, it was doing that. So that was major for me. It was like a massive epiphany. Mm. The second decision was, it was all a part of finding this voice, this direction that I wanted to go in my heart. The second decision was after years of straddling, you know, my own personal aesthetic against those of the, how do I say this, the conceptual contemporary art world that I was largely bombarded with in college. So Mm -hmm. I had this epiphany. I went and attended the Texas Biennial. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of states have these every two years and it's a, it's a big deal and it travels the whole state of Texas and it's supposed to be some of the best painting being done today, contemporary painting being done today. Well, it was held at a major contemporary art center here in San Antonio. I won't name any names, but it took me about seven minutes to see the entire show. Oh, that's so disappointing. I was done in seven minutes because what I quickly realized that I saw so much of the same tired work that I had seen over the past decade or more, and none of it moved me. None of it captured my attention for more than three seconds. And so I realized quickly you know, I do not belong in this sector of the art world. Mm. It held, it holds nothing for me. It's not authentic to who I am. And I was just not, it was not what I was passionate about. At that moment, this grin came across my face. And I realized that there are many trajectories that an artist can take. And this was not the one for me. And so I never looked back. But that was so important. It was pivotal because you're you're torn between these different things. Do I want to be a part of this, which is receiving all this attention and accolades and things? or Being involved in what is apparently the, the cool kids sector of the art world, right? Okay, yeah, exactly. Just biennials, yeah. But it's so inauthentic to who I am. It would have been... And I think it would come through. It's like, you know, hammering this round peg into a square hole or something. And and I once I made the decision that, you know, I'm not going to trash that work. I accept that it's there and it has a purpose and there's room for all of it. And I'm OK with that. It's just not my trajectory. Right. It doesn't connect with me. So once you are honest with yourself, I think that's a huge step so you can move forward with some bliss and purpose. I love that. So, and you, it sounds like when you realize that when you, you mean, you kind of walked in there and you did your, your quick, your quick walk around, it's, it sounds like that rather than feeling sort of dejected or just, uh, you know, you were, it sounds like you were very, it was a relief to you. It was a load off your shoulders. It was, it it was like an elation. I, I genuinely mean it. I felt this warmth in my pit of my belly. And I literally did smile outside and I nodded my head going, yes, (laughs) yes. It was so clear to me that this is not for me. This is not what I do. I will choose not to do this. It's just not me. And it felt wonderful. It was liberating is what it was. Yeah, that's so great because, I mean, I think I just want to kind of highlight that for people that are that are listening that when we're making decisions, we tend to think in terms of what do I do? And how do I approach this as opposed to what do I not do? What do I say no to? Yeah, and that helps. <laughs> yeah, what you say no to is, I think, more important than what you say, say yes to, because that clarity that you're talking about of eliminating, I don't need to worry about these biennials anymore. I am going to focus on this thing. And that is such a just, a, um, yeah, I can understand why you felt relief and why you felt that. Oh, it was liberating. It yes. truly was. I felt like shackles were broken off of me, that I didn't have to play this game and be in two different worlds. Because coming out of academia like that, you, you're you a part of that world as a student. You're very much a part of it. And you have to play that game while you're a student and create things that are, uh, just tear you apart in your guts, but you have to do them. I mean, if you want to past the course, you got to do these things and play the game. And so you do that. And then it's later I realized, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. I painted over a lot of those paintings later. Some, some of them, a few I kept just to remind myself of where I've been. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something useful about that. But the honesty in realizing that I think this whole notion of an art world is kind of a misnomer because I, I think, I think it's much bigger than that. I think I think there are many different trajectories, is the way I like to put it, 
different paths that you can take. There's no one way to go to succeed as an artist. There's many ways you could take. There are a exactly. lot of paths depending on what you want to do. And I think the biggest misconception about the art world is that it's this outside force when in fact we are the art world. Correct. We're part of it. Yeah. So we can direct it. Absolutely. And we can make choices within it and decide which way we want to go. You know, the, you don't have to be tied to one thing because you think this is where it's at. Mm-hmm. Because look, there's a there's that whole world of the blue chip artist, right? It's out there in the ozone somewhere in the stratosphere. <laughs> I don't even think about that world <laughs> because it's one over which you have so little control. Yeah, it's absolutely outside of the realm of your control, and you will be endlessly unhappy, beating yourself to death to try to get into this blue chip world. And you know what I mean. I, I'm talking about uh, the Jeff Coons and the. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, driven largely by money and other things, other markets. That's driven by people who aren't even artists. And Correct. It's, it's like the stock market. And right. I always kind of feel like, well, that's fine. They can go play their game, but there's a whole other world here and we're all doing just fine without you. <laughs> like, we don't need to that's worry a- about that. <laughs> well, you know, you know, entries, I have to say. I don't want to be clear about this. There are some of us within the sort of representational art world, I guess, if I can say that, I'll use that term sort of loosely, who are purists themselves and will bash anything that isn't exactly within this particular niche. I think that's kind of a mistake, too. Mm -hmm. I think I think the art world, there is room for all of it. I I, I believe that there's room for all of that. And Mm -hmm. there are different ways and approaches that people can take to making their art. And it's all valid in its own way. Some of it is going to connect with you and some of it is not. And I think we need to go ahead and just pursue and celebrate the stuff that means something to us that we're passionate about and and go after that. Yeah, I hear this. I hear this a lot about, you know, what is art with a capital A and who's valid and who's not. And I think I think that's just as damaging as, you know, that sort of blue chip mentality of that, you know, you yeah. have to you're not a you're not legitimate unless your paintings are selling for multi million dollars at at Christie's or Sotheby's or whatever. And and we all have our own way of looking at things. And I think I think that there there are criteria that we use to measure art as to what is what is good or what is not there yet. Let's just say like, there's some bad out bar, bad <laughs> art out there. There is. I'm not trying to say that there's no bad art. There is. There's some really terrible stuff out there. There's terrible stuff in the conceptual world and there's terrible stuff in the representational yes. world. <laughs> and so there is, there is an idea of beauty that is, I think is very valid. We know when we see it, we know you know, in the same way that you can walk into the ro- into a room and know when it has been very carefully crafted and put together versus you walk into my storage room or, I mean, <laughs> you can see behind me, my studio right now is a wreck. <laughs> it is not pretty. That is not beauty. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and there are paintings that I think are sort of the equivalent of my, you know, what, what I'm talking about right now, like my studio, which is a total yeah. wreck. And I've, I've made those paintings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna, I won't pretend like I, I haven't, but I think that this, I don't know. I think that people use these ideas to make themselves feel better when they're, when they're very absolute about it and not taking into account that people are on a journey and they're learning and nobody wants to make bad paintings and people are doing the best that they can and they're trying to learn and you don't know where they are on their path. So like you started when you were, you started really painting when you were, you were 50 years old. It's, doesn't have anything to do Isn't with that crazy. It's wonderful. And then, <laughs> and I know I'm going to get a lot of comments about this because I get, you know, people who are asking, am I too old? And the answer I'm always yep. giving you is no, you no. are not. <laughs> In fact, if I could give one piece of advice, well, first of all, you know, well, I started painting in my forties, but I really didn't start going full bore mm-hmm. until I was already 50 years old. And then within five years time, I probably did 25 years worth of work. I mean, I worked a lot, seven days a week. I was just working like a beast. All those years of pent up, (laughs) repressed (laughs) 
things were inside of me that it just had to get out and had to. I was just every day was so exciting. To paint. Yeah. And uh, I was my kids are grown. They're gone. You know, I'm just absolutely free to do my thing. So it was so liberating. And even though I was already at that age, it wasn't that I was worried about, gee, will I make it in the art world? I was concerned less about that than simply making the work and yeah. making it work. And over time, within the first, like, I think I mentioned that one of the other big things was, did I say just getting the studio? Did I mention that? No, we haven't talked about your studio yet. Oh, we haven't. I'm sorry. I would say making the decision to leave my house and rent a studio space that was in town, away from the distractions of home, even though I had to drive over half an hour to get there. It was uh, my sanctuary, this creative space where I didn't have any distractions from the outside world to just focus on what it was that I wanted. Once I made the decision to do that, a number of things happened. Number one, you are focused in this sort of sanctuary, I like to call it. Number two, you realize, well, hey, I'm paying rent now. I got to make this count. I got to make this count. In fact, I told my wife, I don't know why I did this. It was very foolish. But I says, hon, if at any time... Income from the art I make while I'm in the studio doesn't cover all the expenses of my studio, then I'll shut it down and I'll come home. Ooh, I like that. I never looked back and I've mm-hmm. never had to leave. So that was 12, 15 years ago, something like that. I'm curious. I want to ask you, because you did mention that you, you have background in psychology as well. Is that correct? I do. But, but you know, not, I mean, an undergraduate degree, that's yeah. all. Yeah, but you're you're aware of these. I mean, I would guess that that would make you aware of the, these things. So I'm I'm really curious about just psychologically, if you can elaborate on that a little bit. What happened when you made that decision to get this studio and to and to do that? And also that what you just said that that comment about if I don't do this, if my expenses aren't covered, I'm shutting it down. What did that do to you psychologically? Oh, my goodness. I think that turned out to be a very powerful thing because because you're you're being specific. You're throwing a gauntlet down for yourself and a, and a, a goal that's out in front of you that now that I've said it, the words have come out of my mouth, then I must do this. And it's funny. And you told somebody else about it, too, which really I holds did. you accountable. <laughs> it held me accountable. The other thing it did is it meant... I think one of the things you mentioned is is, uh, there's something important that you should do, and that is to show up. So it's like I'm paying for this space. I'm going to use this space. I'm going to be here and I'm going to work even on days when I don't feel inspired. If If you only waited for inspiration to strike, you may not get anything done. You just got to go in there and work. And so I typically will have multiple things going on at one time. And if I'm things aren't quite working out over here. Well, then I'll just shift my gears over here, put Mm -hmm. that down, turn it around, face it toward the wall or something and work on something else. Or maybe I'll sit there and I'll look at the paintings that I've been working on and lament over them or study them. And then sometimes sitting there long enough, you go, aha, and you have one of these epiphany moments. It happens. Mm -hmm. So I think it was very important that I had made that statement to my wife. As soon as I said it, I almost immediately regretted it. Like, what have you just done? And then I said, well, okay, you did this, but so go do it. And the funny thing is, is we've never looked back. And as a matter of fact, over years, you know, I'm also retired from the Air Force. So I have an income that comes in from there. But the income from the paintings after a few years exceeded that income. So we were fine. You know, everything was just jolly and good. Yes. There's something really interesting. When we're starting out as artists, I think it's really important to have some kind of a backup, whether it is your retirement, whether it is your job that's, you know, some you you need a patron of your own arts. And that can be your retirement, that can be your job. You know, a lot of people are upset by the fact that they that they can't devote as much time as they want to because they're working. And I keep reminding them, you have a patron in that job. Take full advantage of it. Take full advantage. Or a husband, you know, a husband, wife, somebody who's, you know, kind of helping you out during that time. But that's that is, I think, is so important as opposed to just diving off a cliff and not having a net. No, you're 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 bringing up a subject that a lot of young artists really wrestle with. And it is one of the key pieces of advice I try to give them. And that is 
if you're going to engage in becoming a quote full time artist, you're going to something you're going to do full time. You either one better have two years worth of savings saved up, saved up to cover your expenses, etc. For that two years of time that you're working to build your career, because believe me, if you think you're going to do that in one year, you're mistaken. You're, you, you really are. You've got to give yourself at least two years and it may take longer, but you better have that much saved up. If you do not, then you do need another source of income coming in while you're building your career, whether it's from another form of part time work that you're doing, whether you have a spouse that's uh, donating some money to, you know, that's helping to support you while you're doing that or a uh, significant other who's doing that, like you say, a patron of some kind. If you don't have that, then so many artists give up. They quit. They they go in there, they go full bore for six months, and it doesn't quite happen because they just didn't plan well enough or they didn't have the resources. You need more time to build your career. And so they set themselves up for failure. And at least telling them this, they can decide, okay, maybe I don't want to engage full time just yet and throw away this job I have over here, et cetera. You find a way that you can do both. That's perfectly fine. A lot of old masters, a lot of the Artists from art history did these things. It wasn't that they just threw themselves out there like the starving artist that's uh, isolated and alone and, you know, eating bugs on the street and uh, survive. I I mean, this this romantic notion is so absurd. You don't have to do that. That's horrible. (laughs) It's ridiculous. And why would you want to do that? And also it doesn't do it like it doesn't. It, there's this weird thing, I think, that like unless you do that, you're not a real artist. And that's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It's ridiculous. In, in fact, I will say this, too, because I'm glad you mentioned that. I also see this in some young artists. Some are in love with the romantic notion of being an artist. And so they decide they're going to be an artist because, after all, all I have to do is say I am and I'm an artist. Right. That's what we're taught in school. The reality is that it really isn't so necessarily. And so they're out there slugging along and living the scene and going to all the shows and the paint splatters all over their pants because that helps add to the coolness of being an artist. And they go to these places. Of course, they're starving to death and can't afford gas in their car. But they like this this whole romantic idea of being an artist when they really haven't done the work the work it takes to do that. And and I have to give them a dose of reality. You know, look, this takes some work. You've got to go in here. You have to show up and you've got to work to do this, to, to give yourself a shot. Yes, there it is true. There is a certain amount of luck, but there are also doors of opportunity. And then when they open, we need to recognize them when we see them and be prepared to walk through them. Because what's really sad is when you don't, the door is standing there open before you, but you're not prepared. You don't have the right shoes or something to put on to get through that door because you aren't prepared. Right. (laughs) You might meet that perfect collector, but you haven't put in the work yet. And I I mean, I... I've gotten angry letters about this, so I know that I'm about to kick the hornet's nest, but (laughs) whatever. Whatever. (laughs) You can write me angry letters. I don't mind. I really believe, I think luck is like 10% of it. I think that that luck favors the prepared. I do. No, I agree. I don't want to. I hope you didn't. I I don't want it at the risk of anyone misunderstanding me. I'm, I'm with you on that. But by the same token, there are moments when an opportunity presents itself. Oh, yes. And you're either prepared to take that by the by the reins and go with it or you aren't. Yes. And so because it's still up to you to walk through that door. Yes. Some people won't out of just sheer fear. They hold themselves back out of fear or they'll go, well, I'm not ready yet. And maybe they really and truly aren't. But sometimes the, uh, the, the ones that say that consistently will never be ready. Get out there, make a body of work, have a dozen, 15 pieces that show a consistent thread of your voice running through it that's of good quality that you would be happy to present to a gallery. Be ready with that so that when that opportunity does come or you have made it appear, you're ready with it. Yeah. Well, I got this one here painting here and I like to show you. <laughs> That's not going to work. Right, right. <laughs> There's work involved in this. It is a profession. And unfortunately, it gets denigrated too much. And it, I think we've heard it by saying everyone is an artist. Well, sure, everyone can make art. Everyone can 
can do these things, I, I suppose. That's true. There's some truth to that. But in terms of doing this as a profession, it should be given the same amount of respect and credence as what it takes for someone to be an airline pilot Mm -hmm. or a nurse or a physician or a lawyer. I mean, they've got to prepare themselves to go out there and do these things. And to be now, the difference is they're licensed. We aren't. Maybe we should be, but we're not. But the point is, is there's still some preparation, some work that you have to put in to move forward in your career. Yeah. And I think that's actually a really, that's a really good analogy. Taking that and going with the the whole luck thing, I've had many, many instances where luck was just, you know, on my side and I had these opportunities handed to me on a silver platter, but I wasn't ready. So I fell flat on my face. Right. So even though the luck was there, I hadn't done the work yet, so I couldn't take advantage of it. And I think that's, that's what I mean. And the more, the more you work and the more you understand where you want to go, where your priorities and all that, then your eyes are open Mm -hmm. and you see that luck. You see those opportunities where you probably wouldn't even have noticed it before. So in terms of, you know, I'd love that analogy of like, you didn't do it intentionally, but you know, this, this idea of, of an airline pilot needs to be able to, you know, needs to, to do the work. Well, yeah. An airline pilot is going to have luck too, but you could you could have the choicest job handed to you on a silver platter. But if you don't know how to fly that plane, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Yeah. So I mean that that's kind of what I mean by this this whole idea of you know I feel like luck is five percent of it or ten percent of it maybe. Yes, people do get lucky. Yes, people do get amazing opportunities. Absolutely. But it only matters if they're they if they're ready for them and they can take advantage of it. You know, like the. The best gallery in the world can come show up on your doorstep. But if you don't have the paintings, they're going to turn around and walk away. This is a problem that I suffer with from time to time. You Not having enough work ready to go for things as they come my way. And that still happens in different phases throughout your career. Yeah. I've had to learn some hard lessons along the way. I think you had asked about some memorable responses you've had to your work, that kind of thing. Yes. And I have two that I'd like to just share because they relate to younger artists and some information they can take away from this experience. The first is I had seen a woman at one of my openings who was literally crying in front of one of my paintings. So apparently something within that work reached her at a very deep visceral level and called to mind something that reached her in a very personal way. And I could not possibly ask for any more wonderful response to something I had created. Now, the second more humorous occasion that comes to mind is when I was still a student. I was a senior in art school and we had done a uh, an exhibition, an outdoor exhibition at a big art fair up in Kerrville, Texas. And I had asked another student, do you think I should take these abstract pieces that I have done? Go, oh, come on, we're going to Kerrville. That's cowboys, and, you know, rednecks and stuff. He says, well, come on, give some credit. Now, a lot of people go to this event. And I said, you know what, I'm going to take them. So I brought these abstract pieces and a few more figurative pieces, student work. And we're up there and our work is hanging. And the way you stand away from your work, people can walk by and you can be a fly on the wall and hear them comment about your work. It's so fun because they don't know who you are. It's so fun. They don't know who you are. And you're standing back and I'm not engaging them at all. I'm just, I decided I'm going to be quiet and let them comment about work because I so much wanted to hear what the unsuspecting public was saying about the stuff that I had done. Well, after about 20 minutes or so, I stood there like a fly on the wall and a couple of old codgers stopped by in front of it. You know, one was wearing his cowboy hat and his boots and the other guy, I don't know what, and he had the chains and things down his side and they were each drinking a beer. And they stood in front of these abstract triptych that I had done and they gazed at it. And the older guy said to the younger guy, I think I could do that while drunk. <laughs> and, uh, after a moment, they, he's nodding in agreement, and they they continued on their way. And I'm sitting there thinking, nodding my head, okay. About 15 or so minutes later, two women stopped in front of this piece. Same painting. They gazed for a moment, and one said to the other, oh, my, someday that's going to be in a museum. <laughs> so what struck me, uh, some very important lessons, is that, is that not everyone is going to connect with your work. Accept that right up front. Not everyone's going to connect with. That is so important. And it's extremely important to know that. And I have to say, 
on the one hand, you're, it stings a little bit when someone doesn't like your work, especially initially. And if you're new at it, it's going to happen. It hurts a little bit inside, but you can't take it overly personal. The valuable lessons I learned is that viewers didn't know me when I was, they didn't know me at all. So they were able to react to the work on its own merit, apart from the one who created it. The same piece was able to elicit completely different reactions. And most importantly, you know, I already mentioned to you is that not everyone's going to connect with your work. So you have to come to accept that and be at peace with that reality. And in the end, you have got to create work that you are passionate about without regard to how someone else may or may not respond to it. Because if you spend all your time trying to create things that you think everyone's going to love, you're going to fail right from the outset. You're, you're creating it, a, a anxiety for yourself. Don't do it. Make the work you're passionate about. Absolutely. Right? It's, yeah. It's like, it's like trying, it's like going into a, a room and trying to make everybody love you. You know, I mean, yeah. and just imagine if you're in the wrong room, you know, <laughs> if you're like, <laughs> you know, if you're, like if you're in, if you're in a room of people who are just not your folks, and you're desperately running around trying to pander to everybody and get them to like you. And it's not going to, you know, it just might not yeah. happen. And I think, you know, we have to kind of admit that that same thing with our art that you just might be in the wrong room. It's not about you or, or your art. Once an artist decides, OK, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get my work out there. Well, let's face it, if you're a visual artist, you have to get your work out there. If your work is being seen, then you practically don't exist. So if you're planning to make a career of being an artist, you want to do this full time, you must put it out there. But once you make the decision to put it out there, you have to be willing to accept the slings and arrows that will invariably come your way with some of this. Mm -hmm. And you can't take it too personally. I know that's easy to say because we've invested so much of our self and our soul into some of these pieces. So a piece of you is up there on that wall. But you have to look at it objectively from the point of view of a viewer looking at a piece of art. Yes. The comment that they're making isn't some negative about the artist necessarily. It's just that piece isn't connecting with them for whatever reason. Yeah. That piece is not connecting with that person. And that's it. That's it. That's it. And deal with it and move on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, it's going to sting. You know, like you said, you're going to get your, your, your slings and arrows. And when the arrow hits it, it hurts, you know, Absolutely. but, but there's, you know, like I, there's this Buddhist saying, and I'm probably misquoting it. So I'm paraphrasing it, but we are going to get hit with the arrows of life that, you know, there's going to, things are going to happen. And then once that arrow hits, we have a choice. Are we going to fire the second arrow? And that second arrow is sort of ruminating on it, keeping that arrow inside of you, twisting it, making it hurt even more? Or do you just say, okay, and move on? So that that second piece of how we actually react to it. The slings and the arrows actually make you strong, I think. When you have suffered, you know, bruises in life and events in life, no matter what they are, mm -hmm. even for things that are relatively painless, like making your art. I mean, in the big scheme of things, you know, I'm someone who has survived cancer. I've survived a heart attack, triple bypass, all this fun stuff. So I've been through some things and working in an emergency room, I've seen more death and dying pain and human suffering than you can imagine. All these things affect you and they help to inform your work. So I bring them to the table when I do make something. And these kinds of things, rather than being negative, I think in a deeper way about stuff. Mm. There are spiritual aspects to our existence, I think, that are beyond the corporeal. And I think for everyone, that's different. I don't try to put any sort of religious names on that at all. But it's just that something more, that something more that extends beyond the physical, uh, everyday mundane that we're faced with every day. Mm. You know, we live in an extremely fast-paced world. Look what we're doing right now. We're talking over Skype real time, doing this podcast. We're bombarded with digital imagery. I mean, gazillions of them a day, I'm sure, through social media, you know, our television sets, our mobile phones, our computers, other kinds of mobile devices. So much so that I think something like, I think the world kind of craves something handmade that took time that an artist created that 
you know, like a painting to me slows down time. It does. You can, it, not only in the act of creating it, which it does, but in the act of viewing it. Rather than a something blistering past you, like on a an amusement park ride, roller coaster or something, in a movie theater, you see all these tremendous effects, but then it's over. It's like a blistering. I can take in a painting and I can walk up to it and I can study it. And I can see this moment in time that was frozen there and think about what the artist was thinking and what they were doing when they were making it and what it was that was inspiring it to begin with. And the sort of responses it's eliciting within me, looking at the light, looking at the brushwork, looking at how it was composed, looking at the visual problems that were solved. There's just it just slows down time. And I deeply appreciate that. And it's one of the reasons why I don't think painting is going to go away anytime soon anyway. I think it's something that is very much a lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. I truly do for, for these kinds of reasons, because I think there is a certain, maybe a certain nostalgic sense that is at play, whereby people still desire that which isn't so fast and quick and artificial. I think it's it's in our DNA in a sense. Like yeah. we, we need, it? you know, it's, an, it's part of our soul. We need it. We, I think we need it. We need it. There's more of a human connection to it. Like, would I respond more to a print that's given to me where 500,000 copies were made of that print or this one singular thing that was hand done by a child and took them, you know, a few hours of laboring over it to make these marks and things. That would be far more precious to me. You know what I mean? So there's that at play in all of this and in this whole notion of painting versus digital art, et cetera. It has its place and I'm not degrading it. I'm just saying, right. no, painting is not dead. Not in my point, not a, from my perspective. It's not very even much close. not dead. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> I would love to hear, because we, we've sort of talked about the the pivotal moments in your, in your career as an artist and some of those responses that you've got to your work. Was there ever a moment where you were just really discouraged or felt like you had this this setback? Oh, absolutely. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> One was when I was struggling to find a process using the metal leaf that I was talking about. Oh, yeah. I've never done that. I'm so curious about it. Yeah. That would work both aesthetically and archivally. And I ran into a big setback. I, after completing this big three foot by three foot painting, I had hung it on the wall. And I waited a day or two for it to dry enough that I could touch it, you know, and I had a little bit of dust on the surface because there's a lot of dust in that space. And I went to wipe it with a rag and about a third of the painting came off. And I was like, horrors, you know, I was like, yeah. oh, my God, what, what in the world happened here? So I quickly realized that this was not going to work. The way I was handling it wasn't going to work. So I needed a way for the oil paint to adhere to the metal. And to keep the composition leaf and the copper from oxidizing and changing color over time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I if I brushed shellac over the leaf, that would work fine if it was just raw leaf. But if it was areas where I created patinas that were chemically induced, it would dissolve those patinas and they disappeared. And so there was no point in doing the patina. So I lost what I did, yeah, especially if I applied it with a brush. Eventually, I tried a number of things and I, and I stumbled across an aerosol polycrylic spray. So this allowed me to build a very fine layers of a sealant in successive layers that would protect the leaf from oxidizing and it would preserve most of the patina and provide this sort of a microscopic tooth that would allow the oil paint to grab onto it. Mm. it, it the oil paint would adhere. So all told, I spent a few months working out these technical problems in my studio until I found what would work. And the takeaway from this is easy, persistence, okay? <laughs> Be persistent, okay? Yes. This was a big setback because I was so happy with the way this painting looked. And then it was just destroyed in an instant because I didn't do things archivally and technically to have it work, to have it stay. So now I have a painting that I did 10 years ago that still looks the same as the day I made it that I kept having used the process that I later discovered would work for what I was trying to do. And so experimenting in your studio, I, I remember all these test strips that I did. 
with different substances, you know, okay, I'm going to use lemon juice. I'm going to use bleach. I'm going to use ammonia. I'm going to use liver of sulfur. I'm going to use this and this, I, I, so many things. I'm going to use this commercially prepared thing and this and this and this until I discovered what they would do on these surfaces. And so I had all these strips laid out and I saw things that didn't work so good. And I saw things that were okay, but they archivally were a problem. And then I saw things that, man, these look good over here. Right. And surprises, right? Yeah. Now, how, now what kinds of things do I use to save it, to seal it so that I can paint over it and around it and preserve it? And so uh, that was the next phase. So all of this took a few months, all told, of trial and error, disaster after disaster <laughs> <laughs> until, and, and you know, sometimes I wanted to just give up and I said, nope, keep at it. Eventually you're going to figure this out. I, I want this to work so badly that I've got, there got to be a way, you know? And so I talked to other guys who did gilding and other things, you know, just commercially like lettering and stuff. You yes. know, what do you guys do? What do you guys do? And, and until eventually I began to discover things that worked. So that was a big setback. I know it's a technical one, but it is a big, was a big setback for me. Yeah, I can imagine you've been working on this painting for a long time. And then all of a sudden, it yeah. just you wipe the whole thing out of accidentally. accidentally. What just yeah. happened? It was, it was horrors. Imagine if that was a commission for someone. Yeah. And you had promised it by X date and it's ready and you go to wipe dust and the paint just comes completely off. I mean, that was just horrifying. Oh my gosh, but- <laughs> yeah. That's really interesting. I used to do paintings on steel and it was so much yeah. fun. Yeah. And I, I was playing with exactly that same problem because I was using these chemicals that, that they, you know, I was talking to a lot of sculptors and mm. the chemicals that they use to do the patinas on outdoor yeah. sculptures and, and using those to kind of paint the painting rather than, than oil paints. Yeah. But then you want to seal it and you want it to stop so that, you know, it yeah. can be. So it doesn't keep oxidizing. Exactly. It keep changing. Yeah. How <laughs> exactly. do I stop that? And then, uh, yeah. And then figuring out how to paint into it. And it's, oh my gosh, it's so much fun. If you use real gold. And I do sometimes in the smaller works. Big paintings are just too expensive when I use it, the real big ones. But when you use the real gold, which I sometimes do, there's just nothing to compare with that luster. Right. Absolutely. You don't have to seal it in terms of it oxidizing because obviously real gold doesn't oxidize, doesn't change. It's not going to change how it looks. But I would seal it anyway with like a clear shellac or something like that. And as you know, shellac will also accept oil paint. So so you, you have more options open to you. And the reason is because of its fragility. It's fragile. And if someone were to touch it or pump it or bang it, it just puts a little protection, a little added protection over it. Mm. So that's that's just a little tidbit for others if they were curious about one of the ways you could also protect that kind of material. Would you mind talking a little bit about your process, how you how you start a painting and how you work? Oh, sure. No problem. Let's see. Well, first of all, I work in a variety of ways. I don't allow I, a long time ago, you know, I'm old enough now where I've decided I will not let anyone put me in a box. Awesome. And I must be careful not to put myself in a box. People will label you. They will they will classify you as something. And I have had that done. If, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up luminism, there's a category under there that says contemporary lum- luminism. Oh, well, guess what? I'm a contemporary luminist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, th- I think that's, I think it's because of your last name. Well, part of it is that, and people have asked me, so what's your real last name? That really is my last name, and which I think is just serendipitous. But I'm very delighted and happy about that. I mean, about this whole, okay, contemporary luminous thing. But at the same time, I do other things too. And I'm, I want to be free to do those other things, like working with encaustic and things like that, because I love encaustic as well. Mm. Lovely, lovely medium. Smaller works in particular, I love to do encaustics because they're so much fun and they're completely different than oil painting. Okay, my process. I will have an idea. Usually it's an imagined space, but sometimes I will use the figure. But let's let's say for the sake of this discussion that it's an imagined space. Maybe I'm inspired by a canyon that I have seen or something like that. Well, I'll take it and I'll change it. I'll change the canyon and maybe I'll put it in a slightly different environment or a different perspective. And I'll sketch these out just with shapes, little shapes, little sketches, just overall shapes. They're very small, but not detailed at all. And then I will work up something in a drawing that gives me a general idea of where I want to go with the shape of this thing. Sometimes I will grid that out and then 
transfer that general shape to a large panel. Let me back up to the panel, though, because I know people going to want to know this. How, okay. do you, how do you prepare these panels? I used to work on hardboard a lot or wood, but I had trouble with warpage. Yeah. If you ship something from San Antonio and it goes to California and you hang it on the wall, then the bottom right corner might move away from the wall an inch and a half or two inches. And that drove me crazy. So I switched over to these die bond aluminum panels or Mm -hmm. e-panel, the composite aluminum. What you have to do, and I don't do this myself. I used to, but I pay a guy to do all this stuff. All I do is paint now. So this guy prepares my panels for me. I pay him. So he'll sand it lightly until there's a light powdery surface on it. And then I have him use denatured alcohol to wipe the surface to get rid of the oils and the residue. And then he puts down three coats of gesso. Okay. And then he sands those lightly. Three coats of just regular acrylic gesso. Puts, mm-hmm. puts that down. And then because I, if I know I'm working with gold leaf or copper or something, I tend to like to put a red oxide underlayment. I'll tone the whole panel with red oxide. So I have him dilute about 20% water to 80% acrylic red oxide paint. And he'll put it on with a rag loosely in one coat and then let it dry overnight. And then he'll put another coat on it. I have at least two coats of that on it. Oh, by the way, before he ever puts any of this gesso and stuff on it, I have him burr the edges of the uh, aluminum panel. Oh, so it's not sharp. It's not sharp. They bend down a little bit so your paint will wrap around. The other thing I have him do before he does anything, is I have him glue one by twos with Gorilla Glue on the back of the panel. One by twos, almost in a frame, about an inch and a half away from the edge. What this allows me to do is to float the painting off the wall or to screw it into a floater frame Mm -hmm. through the back of the floater frame into the wood pieces that are glued onto the aluminum. And then it floats inside that frame. Nice. Yeah, because that's Understand? always a problem. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So it's a very easy way to solve it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With getting flat panels to into a floater frame. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And when you screw it in there, everything is flush. There's no warpage. There's nothing that's funky. It's nice and square. The other thing is it gives the client, the buyer, more options. If they like the frame that you have it in, well, beautiful. If they don't, they can unscrew the back and they can pop it in a regular frame with rabbits and all that stuff, a normal frame, or they could just hang it right off the wall and let it float off the wall without a frame at all. So they can put it in a normal frame because you've put those one inch pieces on the back and they're away, and away from the edges, away from the edges. Right, so they could right. pop it right in. Yeah, right. exactly. Got so it. they have a lot of options. Mm-hmm. So this was just something that I decided to start doing a few years ago because it just gives your collector a lot of options. I'm mm-hmm. sorry if I digress too much. I love this stuff now. Okay. Well, this, if this is something that people are interested in, they will be. My <laughs> process is a little weird. So let so now I have this red panel, right? Now, I will put my drawing on. Sometimes I'll loosely describe a drawing. Sometimes I will grid from a smaller one. Which I have to say, I'm kind of surprised because you're more like I see you as more of an abstract artist. And this might be my okay. own. It depends on the piece. That's why I just said it depends yeah. on the piece. I would say 80% of the time, I'll just loosely put some marks there about where I want to go. And here's why, entries. If I know that I'm going to build some texture in some particular places... I mix light molding paste by Golden with that red oxide acrylic. I Uh mix them together inside the the jar it comes in. And then I take a big old spackling knife and I'll start raking this stuff in the areas where I want thick texture. And I'll drag it across. And it's sort of a technique thing. You scrape it off a little bit and then you wait for a little bit and then you hit it again, pick it up and hit it again. And it makes very, you have to experiment with this. It will make interesting ridges. It will make interesting clumps and valleys and things. And it only comes with time that you realize how these are going to work for you. So I'll do this in the underlayment areas where I want these textures. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. And so you're, are you kind of... (laughs) This is this is where I get really into the details. So when you said that you're using that acrylic paste and you're putting you're putting it on in thick layers and then you're waiting, are you waiting till it's fully dry? Or are you purposely letting it be semi dry and playing with the texture? It's semi wet and I'm playing with it, and then ah, then I leave guy. it. I leave it to dry overnight completely. Yep, yep. It yep. has to dry overnight. Yeah, because it's it's very different if you're if you're allowing if it's if it's almost dry but not quite, you can get. Very different textures. You can still move and need textures. Yeah, yeah, Really yeah. need textures. Great. You're right. Love it. And I suggest that an artist experiment with that until they find things that are working for them. Then what I'll do is I'll sand that down because I want the tips to be sanded. Mm-hmm. 
The mistake I used to make is I would put the white molding paste down and I would paint it with the red oxide. Well, when you go to sand, you take those tips off and you see all these white blobs. That's why I mix the acrylic with the light molding paste to, to make it red all the way through. Does that make sense? Yep. So whatever your tone is, whatever you're toning your panel with, you can mix that color into your molding paste. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so I put the molding paste down. By the way, I don't use that in every painting, just if I want thick texture somewhere. Mm-hmm. Make sense? So, because not every painting is the same. Let's say I want to make something that looks very much like rock. I want large canyons, rocky structures somewhere. And I'll build these textures because it just gives me something more. Then what I'll do is I go, okay, where do I want my light to be in this piece? And this, and, I, and then I'll put down sizing. One shot makes a sizing for gold leaf. It's called gilding size. I used to like the stuff made by Rolco, but they went out of business for some reason. And I love theirs. This stuff is not as good. I've had to figure out the time on it. I use sponge brushes, you know, those little cheap sponge brushes you can buy in Home Depot for 59 cents. I use those to put the uh, sizing down so I don't get any hairs caught in the sizing. Mm. Just use a sponge brush. And I let that sizing sit for about 45 minutes to an hour. Then I pull out my composition gold leaf. And I might have some nitrile gloves on or something like that. And I keep some wax paper handy, you know, I'll lay it where I want it. And then I just kind of blow. I let it drop and then I blow like that. Mm. And it and it spreads out and flattens over the sizing. Are you working up? I'm working or flat. A, you're working I'm working flat. flat. Yeah. Okay. I'm working on a big eight foot table flat right now for all of this process. So I put the gold leaf down, long story short, put it down where I want it. Then I can do one of two things. I can burnish it with a soft brush a little bit, make sure it's sticking good in places. Or I can take a sheet of wax paper and lay it down and take a soft rag and I rub this wax paper and burnish the gold leaf into the sizing. But sometimes the wax paper will pick up areas of the gold leaf because you accidentally got some of the adhesive onto the wax paper. Mm. Just be forewarned, that kind of thing can happen. So once I've done all of that, and I'm happy with where the gold leaf is. And sometimes I'll just put big areas. And, but, but this comes with practice because if I want to paint clouds, I will use some of the gold underneath to peek through to be those clouds. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm trying to use stuff in the underlayment, if you will, layers later to come out as physical form. You, I will paint in negative spaces to create the positive shapes of certain things. So it's, it, it, you get it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so once the gold is down and it's where I want it, if I want an area where I just want to feel more energy or something like that, I spray my little chemical preparation, kitchen secret stuff in, in those areas. And depending on what I'm using, and I encourage people to experiment, I might get little whitish areas. I might get pale blues, almost like turquoise. I might get something else. That's interacting with the leaf? Yes, Mm -hmm. with the leaf. If you use real gold, you will not get that. You use the fake stuff if you want that. Got it. Sometimes it's too much or it's too intense and it eats right through the gold leaf and I get the red from underneath. And you know what? I'm perfectly cool with that too. Right, right. And later, you got to let that sit overnight. So you've got another day gone come back in the next day and you look at what you've got. Sometimes you can put more sizing down and add more leaf if you've got areas that are really funky. So you can, you can still do that. Once all that's there and you got your chemicals down, you got your little spots and sprayed areas that, where you want them, I seal it. And I use polycrylic spray. This, by the way, is a huge secret I'm revealing to people who dun, dun, dun. their paintings will not work without this. OK, and I have it flat and usually outside. If I have to be in a studio, I go in the hall and I wear a respirator and I spray above the piece side to side and let it fall. I let it lightly fall on the painting and I use the clear satin version of polycrylic sealant. I'll spray one coat. I wait an hour. Then I spray another coat the other direction Mm -hmm. and I put on seven coats of this stuff. So it takes like a full day to do this. Oh, wow. And I wait a day. I leave it alone. And now I've got, you would not believe the tooth I have on this panel now. There's a lot of seven coats of that with an aerosol can. And I have choked off the air from the gold leaf. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it, so it's not going to oxidize. Got it. The the areas that I don't want to oxidize are going to stay clear. Do you ever mask anything off because you want it to oxidize? I have. 
I have done that. So it just depends on the piece. Yeah. And then I then I will begin working in transparent glazes in the beginning. So my darkest darks I put down usually, and I don't know how detailed you want me to get, but I might use, I typically will use a lizarin permanent, maybe some phthalo blue and a touch of asphaltum or some kind of dark earth color. Yep. And I'll, uh, all transparent though. And I'll make a chromatic black, a very dark. And if I want to shift it toward the red, I'll have more alizarin. If I want to shift toward the blue, I'll have more phthalo. If I shift to green, I'll add a little more of the asphaltum. So I could shift that slightly if I want to, just by how much I mix of those three colors. Uh huh. And I'm using liquid. That's what I'm using because it dries quickly. Yep. And it allows for the kind of flow I want for the glazes. So I build my glazes and I might be done. I have to sit for the day and you gradually build these up. Yeah. You build these up, you build these up. And then there are areas where you move to your more opaque paints and I'll have a full complement of my colors. And when I'm painting into the aerial spaces, I start working down from top to bottom and working in those spaces. And you, you know, you play and you do your brushwork and you do your thing like any other painting until it all just sort of comes together and you just kind of know when it does. Right. Or at least you, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's just a, that's the part where it's just you and your studio working until you've created what it is you want to make out of this thing. And then over time, I decided because I love the figure also, I'll inject figures into these spaces or, you know, I'll go ahead and use figures. Because I love doing the figure. If, if if after six months of doing the figure, I get bored with intense observation, I go back to these spaces that are more imagined and slightly more abstract. They're not completely abstract. They're more of the they're more of an idea of a space. Yeah. I'll give you a, a short story. When I was in college, I had one particular art teacher. In fact, she was teaching abstraction, abstract painting, who used to tear me apart because I would paint this horizontal line somewhere in my space, even if it was a very abstract piece. Steve, you got to get rid of this line. Every time you do that, it's a landscape. I don't care what you, it's a landscape. Okay, so I got rid of the line. Mm-hmm. As soon as I graduated, I said, I'm going to put lines in all of them. So I put <laughs> lines <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. I'm putting those horizontal lines. And if it makes reference to landscape, that is perfectly cool with me. In fact, you know what? I want to. I'm going to exploit that <laughs> damn line and put it in there. So You've got a little bit of the rebel in you, don't you? That's what it was. It was because someone told me, don't do that, that I decided I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it a lot Mm -hmm. now that I'm free to do it. And I do. I don't always do it, but the vast majority of the time I do. And because I know I'm creating these sort of ideas of spaces and people refer to that. If they're going to refer to landscape anyway, I go, okay, I'll just exploit that. Yeah. And they will be these sort of notions of a space. They're not real. They're made up. Yeah. But, but they could be a place that someone has lived to. Maybe it calls up some remembrance in someone of something that they have thought of. Some of them are very violent looking. Some of them, I've been told, look like nuclear bombs and this kind of thing. But they all have a reason behind them. They, there's a basis that inspired them. There's something that caused me to be interested in making that piece. And then that may lead to a body of work. Gotcha. They feed off of each other. What is it that... Do you, what is, what do you feel like is the common thread in your work? What is it that you are just continually fascinated by? Well, I'm endlessly fascinated with, with light, obviously. And that's corny. How many artists tell you that? But more specifically, <laughs> the sublime. I'm very, I'm very much interested in the sublime. Uh, it is something that, and when I say the sublime, I'm not talking about Immanuel Kant, Kant, however you want to pronounce his name. You know, Barnett Newman and those kind of works, very abstract works, were considered sublime. They were playing with the sublime because they felt like the sublime was something that you couldn't really represent with a physical object. So they were playing with just paint and maybe a zip line that separated it and caused you to have a depth of space in a color field, if that makes any sense. But they're abstract. So that notion of the sublime really came from Kant, Immanuel Kant. Mine is more refers to Edmund Burke. I'm more interested in the, if, if you think about the feeling you get, or you might get if you're walking out onto a precipice, you're just edging to the edge of a cliff and it's like a thousand feet down and you're right there and you're just about to fall over that feeling you get when you're just about to fall over, but someone grabs you at the last minute or you never really hit the bottom. That to me is a a vivid expression of of the sublime. Yet with Burke, it deals a lot with nature, the overpowering, awesome, 
depiction of nature, how small we are in comparison to a massive mountain, an erupting volcano over here, the crashing sea. To, you're, you're like a flea mm-hmm. against the power of the sea. Those things deal with the sublime. I try to be less literal with it, but I'm still very much interested in that. Some people have compared some things I've done to Turner. Well, I'm very honored and flattered and humbled by that. I'm not fit to carry his paintbrushes, but I think we have a similar sensibility, if you will. Mm. I could see things that interested him. Those same sorts of things interest me in 2017 with a different twist is all. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I keep coming back to, as much as I try not to, this whole notion of the sublime. It attracts me deeply. I like the idea of, I think I sort of venture into that realm of spirituality a little bit, you know, the sort of an inner being kind of approach to some things, the ethereal. Yeah. That is something that is very attractive to me. I don't know why it is. I don't fight it. It just is. And so it's something I have to express. In other words, some painters really want to paint narrative Mm -hmm. and they're very good at it. And it's what they do. And they do magnificent things with multiple figures, creating these beautiful narratives. My narratives are not obvious and they aren't intentional. Those are within the viewer. I am more interested in something else. (laughs) More the feeling and the the emotion of it. I want to evoke the feeling rather than intellectually stimulating you. Right. Although that's a good thing. That is not my aim. Right, right. It's more like whereas narrative painting wants to explain something to you, you're wanting people to receive an emotion and create their own story. And I think that's valid. I think that's a perfectly valid way to paint. Everything doesn't have to be narrative or everything doesn't have to be explained with a thousand word statement to tell you what you're looking at. I don't think we need all that. Right. You know, I think that's fine for artists who want to do it. So I'm not knocking it. And it may be their approach for expressing themselves. It isn't mine. Yeah. Well, and and I think what's kind of like, we we sort of need all of it in some, you know, in some ways, it's just like, if you think of the books on your bookshelf, you have some that are, you know, you might have hard fact, historical books, you might have very wonderful fiction, you might have like all sorts of things. And that doesn't make any one of the authors less than the other. And my bookshelf is filled with all of the above. And I don't feel like I have to choose. (laughs) Right. There are art books, for example, that are that way as well. You've got some that delve very much into the how, Mm -hmm. into the techniques of what to do. And then there are some that talk more about the why. Mm -hmm. Those are every bit as fascinating, sometimes more, Mm -hmm. and are very useful to you. And then, of course, there are the art books that your art heroes that have done magnificent paintings that you get inspired by that you want to just look at and have their big catalogs and things. Those are marvelous, too. Yes. They, They really and truly are. I haven't asked this question in a long time, but I really want to know from you, if you could own a painting by any living artist. (laughs) I know everybody hates this question, but I love the answers. Okay. What would it be or whose? It can either be a specific painting or a work by a person. Okay. I'm going to answer your question and I'm going to answer it away. Probably a lot of them do. I think there are too many that I could not choose just one, but Mm -hmm. I will give you a few. Is that fair? I'll give you a few I would be very happy to have because it would be impossible. If I said one right here, I'd be, oh, dang it. I I forgot about this person. Oh, I forgot about that. that I would like them too. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make you (laughs) give me the definitive list of artists, but I I think what it, what it does is it, it's, it, it usually inspires people who are listening to the program to to look at artists that they may, may not know of. Absolutely. Okay. Adam Miller is an artist who's one of his, I enjoy having one of his pieces happily. Alex Konevsky, I would be thrilled to have one of his pieces. Andrea Coach, I think she's just utterly brilliant. I don't know her work. See, that's exactly why I ask. All right. It, it's spelled K-O-W-C-H. It okay. looks like couch, but she pronounces it coach. Tremendous narrative in her work and very mysterious. I think she's brilliant. Victor Wang. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with him, maybe. The the scale of his work is just phenomenal, and the thick, juicy paint he uses is unbelievable. I think Jeremy Mann is creating a lot of great work. Anne Gale is magnificent. Alyssa Monks. Mm -hmm. Odd Nerdrum, because I wouldn't mind having an Odd Nerdrum. (laughs) 
Alexander Sigov, S-I-G-O-V, is much more illustrative, but they're beautiful and they're complex and lacy-like. They're really wonderful paintings. Perhaps Jeremy Lipking, Stephen Assail. Well, actually, I have one of Stephen Assail's, but it's a silver point drawing. Uh, Joel Ray, an Australian painter. He deals with fantastic realism, but he's really good at it. There's an artist named Ran Ortner. I don't know if you're familiar with Ran Ortner. No. He paints the sea, but he paints it so big that it looks like you're walking into it. There's no reference. It's like the sea as mother, as a embryo. And it, it's you're walking into these massive paintings and they're painted so exquisitely, so beautifully. It's mind numbingly gorgeous. Wow. And they're massive. So, yeah, I'd like one of his. I, I don't have a wall that's big enough to take one, but <laughs> I'd have to build a wall that would. And it'd probably be worth it. <laughs> And there are so many more. There really are. There are so many more I could list. Just I could just tick them off. But yeah, I would be happy to own any of this book. Start the collection there. Well, you know, here's the thing. Isn't it great that we're living in a time where there are so many really, really great artists working and working in an area that's been so badly maligned and panned for so many decades. Mm. And yet here you're seeing that kind of work beginning to be celebrated more. And there is a much deeper conscious effort, it seems, and a resurgence in work like that. And it's being done as well as it was done in the time of the old masters. I mean, there's just some beautiful work being done today, I Mm. think. And I'm always encouraged when I'm greatly encouraged when I see that. It just makes my heart warm Mm -hmm. when I see how beautiful work being done. By the way, is that your, is that an iceberg is that iceberg painting yours back there? That is. That's wonderful. <laughs> I you. kept seeing this glacier back there. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> it's that is that is my current obsession. Are, are those? Well, it, I was in Dallas not long ago, a few years ago, and I saw these icebergs paintings by Frederick Church mm. in the uh, Dallas Museum of, of Art. Oh wow! God, what a, what a magnificent piece! Oh man. And he did a whole series of those, of these icebergs. A lot of people know him for the waterfalls and Niagara yeah. and all of that. But he's done some on icebergs that are extraordinary. Oh, wow. But anyway, I like your piece a lot from what I'm seeing from here. Thank you. Appreciate that. Did I answer that? On you the- did. And now I have a <laughs> wonderful list of people to explore. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's sort of my gift to, you know, to the listeners and to myself because I love, I love it. <laughs> yeah, there's so many good ones working. Oh, my goodness. I know. So what are you working on? What do you have coming up next? Where can we see your work and where can people find you? Okay, I've got multiple irons in the fire and I want to mention these uh, as quickly as I can. I'm doing a a charity event in London. I've sent some work over there, and uh, I'm going to be a part of a miniature show here in town uh, in September. I won't even be here. I'll be on vacation and out of state when it happens, but I'm doing a miniature for that. I'm also going to be working with San Antonio's got a tricentennial coming up, 300 years. Really? Yeah, it's coming up. It's like next year, 300 years. And they got 300 artists, and they've assigned a year to each artist to paint. Interesting. And so I have 1865. And so I have to look up 1865 and look at the history here and see what sort of events were out there that I can then create a piece of art from. We have limited sizes and they're being shown in three different big venues in the city, these 300 works of art, each one representing a year, which I think is kind of a cool idea. That is a really cool idea. I love that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So we're doing that, working on that. I'm also doing a few commission pieces and some, you know, some other smaller works for charity. I'm um, creating some works for a solo exhibit next May here in town. That So you have a solo coming up in, in Austin then? Okay. Yeah, in San Antonio. I actually live in San Antonio. Why did I just uh, say Austin? You've been saying San Antonio like all... Because Jennifer Bulkin is from Austin. Yes. <laughs> you talked to Jennifer recently. She's from Austin. So is... Uh, Karen Offit is from there, too. And they're both lovely, pe- lovely people and great painters. I like them both very much. I'm painting with some of what we've talked about, these imagined spaces, again, distant, ethereal. And I'm toying with the idea of the structures themselves being the source of light. Oh, interesting. Like if you have rock, that is a source of light rather than the light striking it. So I'm having some of that. But here's the fun stuff. I'm curating an issue for Poets Artist Magazine called 100 Great Figurative Works of 2017. And this magazine is an international open call 
and it will have a, an invitation to, I'm going to invite some artists and then some will be invited to, to be a part of this open call. It's going to include impressions of some great figurative work created in 2017, paintings, drawings, etchings, sculpture, no photography, no digital, and no portraiture. Some people will go, ah, oh, because they do an issue that oh, is exclusively yeah, okay, devoted so. to portraiture. Mm -hmm. So no, you know, head and shoulder type portraiture. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the deadline for that is November 1st of this year. And it has to be work that was done in 2017. I hope people will respond to that call because it, these issues are usually really, really wonderful. You'd be surprised the work being created out there, not only in our country, but in places like South America in Eastern Bloc European countries. It's astonishing yeah. where we find works from. Yeah. I'm also just beginning to consider artists who I'm going to select for, for publication, but also for a physical exhibition in San Antonio next November. There will only be 16 artists selected for that. 16 works, and they're all figurative paintings, that particular show. That theme is still being worked out. But the artist selected for that will be published in the magazine, but it will be more focused on just a few, just 16 artists. And then they will have an exhibition here in San Antonio in 2018. So I'm working on that, too. Busy. Busy, busy, busy. I got a lot of irons in the fire. I promised myself I wouldn't do this. And uh, that's one of the things I try to tell young artists, learn how to say no. And, uh, <laughs> it's a very important word. I mean, we all learned it when we were two years old and then we forgot it. <laughs> Exactly. You had asked me something about, I think it was, what is a painting that you've done that you will always keep? Yes, that's, I, yeah, because it's so interesting to me because we have, all of us have these, I don't know, these ones that are just really special to us, either because we had a specific breakthrough at that moment, or it yeah. is a more of a nostalgic personal reason. Well, there's there's two pieces. One is a drawing, it's a portrait that I did of my wife. I'm always going to keep that, of course. Yes. And it will be passed down on my grandkids and let them fight over it. But that I will always keep. But in terms of painting, there's one that I have. It's called Odyssey After Bierstadt. And that particular painting I'm keeping because it was inspired by Bierstadt, but it's obviously not. It's obviously more abstracted. And it was for a show that I was doing, a solo show in Houston. But my wife came up to meet me for lunch, and she stood there and looked at it. And I said, you ready to go? I put my brushes down. And she goes, I want that. And I said, excuse me? She goes, I want that. And I said, well, hon, you know, I'm doing it for this show in Houston. And uh, she looked at me with that look. Yes, you, that that is what I call pulling the wife card. She pulled the wife card. The, the look was, you know, that look. Yeah, there's no discussion. This is over. And I said, well, well, how about this? How about I make you another one? It might even be better. And I got the look, and this time it intensified. So I said, okay, how about this? How about you can have this one, and I'll paint them another one. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, there you go, Steve. <laughs> she nodded and said, yes, let's go to lunch now. And we went to lunch. So I had to call my gallery and say, you remember that piece I sent you an image of yesterday? I, I, I can't give it to you because my wife wants it. So, well, can you bring it at least and we can use it for maybe a commission or something? I said, okay, I'll bring it, but you have to put it out for sale or something. So they put a red dot on it when I brought it. That hangs in the bedroom because it's my wife's and it's so rare that she says, yes, I want that. But she said, I want that. So that was hers. And the look I got was, obviously it was hers. I mean, there was, <laughs> there was yeah, you're... <laughs> there, there was, I like peace in my home. <laughs> <laughs> I know that look because I've, I've. <laughs> yes. Happy wife, happy life. It's very true. Exactly. It's true. It absolutely is. So that's the answer to that question. I love it. Well, Steve, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. I could sit here for another hour with you. It's been fantastic. It would be fun. I enjoyed speaking with you. You're a delightful person. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Steve Deleuze. Go to SavvyPainter.com to see examples of Steve's paintings. You can also see the painting that Steve mentioned his wife gave him the look for, as well as links to all of the artists that we mentioned. Just go to SavvyPainter.com and click on podcast. In just a few weeks, I am opening enrollment for my next online program. I'll be announcing the details in September, but I'm super excited about what I have planned. 
This is an ongoing membership type program with a strong community of dedicated artists who are committed to mastering their practice and moving their art to the next level. And as with all of my programs, there will be live video calls, practical challenges to help you learn how to create, share, and yes, sell your art. New to this program, though, are monthly guest artists. If you're on my workshop list, you don't need to do anything else. You will be getting announcements very soon. But if you're not on the list and you've been wanting to work with me, now's your chance. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshops. Slots for this one are going to fill up fast. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for supporting this podcast. Much gratitude goes out to Carla Roth, Inner Vision Studio, Mary Piazza, Melissa Nolan, Shirley Williams, Jennifer Lessman, Amanda Cavanaugh, David Gorski, Sylvia Bailey, Margaret Serena, Carla Klassen, Roberta Edwards, Greg Decker, Christina Rotelli, Andy Robbie, Glary Becerra, Jasmine Elliger, Christo Volkoff, Martha da Costa, Gabrielle McDermott, Don Chandler, The Roaring Artist, Virgil Dyson, Phoebe Peterson, Kathy Beale. Alexis Redden, Maureen Nathan, Rebecca Maynard, and Bruce Garrity. Without your help, the Savvy Painter would not be possible. I really, truly appreciate your support. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>